Dr. Kindler. I know that our audience would be interested in your very early background. Were your parents musical? Yes, Mr. Brown. Both of them were. My mother was a pianist, and my father was an oboe player and conductor. Well, do you have any brothers or sisters who were or are musicians? They all were musically inclined, and my two sisters both played the piano. Oh, was the cello the first and only instrument you studied? Oh, no. In Holland, when you go to the conservatory, you are supposed to study not only one instrument, but several others. So besides the cello, I had to play the piano, and eventually I learned to play a little bit on the French horn. When did you make your first appearance as a soloist? When I was about 12 years old, I was what was known as a bit of a wunderkind. But uh, although in the beginning I did play quite a number of concerts of a minor sort, my real debut came when I was 17 in Berlin with the Berlin Philharmonic as soloist. Well, while in Berlin, you also taught at the conservatory there, didn't you? Yes, that's right, at the Klindworth Scharwenka Conservatory, which is quite a mouthful, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it certainly is. And when did you first come to America, and why did you come to America? I came on a visit in July 1914. There was no talk of war at that particular moment, but uh, on the 1st of August, the First World War started, and, of course, because of that unpleasantness, I had to stay in America, which was a good thing for me. Well, what made you give up your career as a cello soloist while you were still at the peak of international fame? Well, I have always believed that an artist should not repeat himself too much, and I think I have proven that in my career. I started as a cellist in an orchestra first in Berlin in the opera, and then afterwards when I was here in America, I played with Mr. Stukowski as first cellist for seven years, and then when I was through with that, I uh, became a soloist and uh, played as soloist for about ten years all over the world, but then I wanted to do something else again at a certain moment when I was uh, satisfied with the amount of work that I had done in that particular career, so that was why I wanted to start conducting. Oh, where did you first conduct? Well, I conducted in several places, uh, practically simultaneously, if you could say so. That is to say, I was on a tour with Mrs. Coolidge in Europe and had to jump in because some conductor uh, for chamber orchestras there became ill and I conducted uh, one day after the next in uh, Rome and in Milan and in Paris and several other places. Then, shortly after that, I was engaged for one of the Sunday night concerts of the Philadelphia Orchestra, and a little while afterwards, I was engaged to conduct here at the Library of Congress in Washington, where I did the world premiere of Stravinsky's uh, ballet, which was called Apollo. And that was in 1928, wasn't it, Doctor? That's right. Well, in uh, founding the, the National Symphony Orchestra, what were some of the major obstacles you had to overcome in developing it to its present state? Well, first of all, that there had been uh, three or four attempts made in Washington before, which had not been successful. Uh, that, of course, mitigated against the whole idea. Then, uh, it happened to be the time of the Depression, and everybody said, uh, how can you possibly start an orchestra in the time of the Depression? And my answer was, well, if people don't want music when they are depressed, when will they want music? But nevertheless, it was an obstacle, and a very serious one, which I had to overcome. Inasmuch as you are a cellist, do you feel that you were more discriminating in choosing the members of your cello section and that for that reason it would probably be the best section in your orchestra? Well, uh, naturally I have uh, had a bit of a reputation for that, but it isn't true because naturally when you get a very fine first instrument in another section, let's say the oboe section or the flute section, that section will benefit just as much as if you have a very fine first cello. No, I can't say that I was particularly harsh on the cello. Well, what have been some of the greatest thrills or greatest thrill which you have gotten in your many years with the National Symphony Orchestra? Oh, there have been so many, more than I uh, nearly can remember, but I do 
know that, for instance, uh, my first performance, for me, that is to say, of uh, the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven was a tremendous thrill. And, uh, for instance, also when uh, Rachmaninoff was extremely enthusiastic uh, about our accompaniment when he played as soloist with us. And, for instance, uh, when Chrysler played for the first time with us. I always had had a great admiration for Chrysler, naturally, and it was a great joy and a great privilege and a great thrill to have him appear with us. But there have been so many uh, first performances of great work, uh, new work, all of those give an artist a tremendous, well, shall we say, lift. Yes, I know that that does, Doctor. But you've conducted most of our leading orchestras. Do you run across many of your former players in these orchestras? Everywhere I go, I find players who, sometime or other, have played under my baton with the National Symphony Orchestra. And that means literally everywhere that I have conducted. For instance, quite recently, I was guest conductor in Philadelphia, the great Philadelphia Orchestra. And sure enough, there, there were about a half a dozen men who had, at one time or another, uh, played with me in the National Symphony Orchestra. But as far west as Hollywood, I have found them also. In Chicago, with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. In Cleveland, in uh, all different other orchestras, I always find, again, men who have played with us here in the National. Well, then, I think you've had a great part, Doctor, in helping developing the orchestras of our nation as a whole, because I know that you go to the different conservatories, pick out what you consider the outstanding talent, give them their chance, develop them, and then, of course, the larger cities who have larger budgets and can afford to pay more, take them away eventually, but it's still all to your credit. But wasn't a very high honor bestowed upon you by Queen Wilhelmina of Holland? Yes, I am an officer of the Order of Orange Nassau, which is the highest order that a foreigner, because now, of course, I'm a naturalized American, uh, can get. Well, I understand that you've also been awarded many other honors. Can you tell us something about some of them? Well, if you want to know, all right, uh, I have been the recipient of the Coolidge the medal for music. I have been the recipient of the Marlow Medal. My name was uh, uh, put on the walls of distinguished American citizens who had done uh, work for American culture in uh, the New York Exposition about uh, six, seven years ago. Uh, I am honorary member of a number of societies. I am a doctor of music, an honorary doctor of George Washington University, etc. Well, you've conducted orchestras all over the world. How do they com uh, compare now, after the war, with the way in which they played before the war? Well, of necessity, they are not as good as they once were. The reasons are many. First of all, because a number of their good men have been killed, others have left the country, and also the nationalistic tendencies in the different countries is not a good one for the development of orchestras. No one country uh, can say that it has a prerogative on excellence for all kinds of players. For instance, uh, woodwind players are better in France than they are in, for instance, Germany or in my own country. Russian fiddlers are better than fiddlers in other countries. And where formerly, uh, for instance, a great orchestra like the Amsterdam Orchestra would engage a French oboe player, because in Holland we didn't have such good oboe players, uh, and maybe a, a Russian concertmaster. Now they have to be all Dutch, and that is not to the advantage of the orchestra. And that is the same way all over Europe, I found. Now about tomorrow night's concert, out of the hundreds of pieces in your uh, repertoire, how and why did you choose the ones that you did for your final concert? Well, uh, first of all, I'm going to conduct a symphony by an old bohemian composer, which I discovered, a man by the name of Sami. I have made a practice of trying to give our audiences uh, those old works which very often are rather unknown. And I'd like to end my uh, career here in Washington for the time being anyhow uh, by doing the same thing, by giving a first performance in Washington of one of those old works. Then Don Juan of Strauss has been requested by a large number of people because we have made a recording of it 
and uh, the end of the first half of the concert uh, will consist of a new work by an American composer, which we played for the first time uh, earlier in the season, and which I think bears repeating, especially for our different audience on Wednesday night. It's McConkie's Ferry by uh, George Anfield. Then the second half uh, will be the fourth symphony of Brahms, which I love more than nearly any other work of that particular composer, certainly. And uh, consequently, I think that will be a fine finish to the season. Well, what are your future plans, Doctor? Uh, the day after the concert, we go to New York, and uh, the next day, from New York to Sweden. Uh, we go on the Gritz home, and we arrive in Göteborg toward the end of the month, when uh, I will give two concerts in that particular city. From there, we go to Stockholm for three concerts early in April. And from Stockholm, we go on to Helsinki, the capital of Finland, uh, where I have three concerts again, and also a lecture on American music and on American orchestras for the Finnish American Society. Then I received a letter of welcome from probably the world's greatest composer, Sibelius, asking us to come and visit with him in his country home where he's living now, in Jarvenpo, in the country outside of Helsinki. And of course, we accepted that invitation. From there, we will go on south. I have been asked to conduct several concerts in Budapest. I don't know whether that will be possible uh, at this particular time. I also have been asked to go to uh, Switzerland, which we will certainly do, for three concerts by the great modern conductor Scherchen. Uh, from there, we will go to Paris. And uh, after that, I will want to have a long, quiet rest. As General Eisenhower said one time, He'd like to sit on a porch and rock slowly for a long time. Well, Dr. Kindler, I know that all Washington wishes you the best of everything in all your future undertakings, and we all owe you a deep debt of gratitude for what you've done in developing the musical culture of Washington and America as a whole. Thank you for having appeared on our program, and the best of luck to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown, and thank, please, the loyal and wonderful Washington audience.